and you are now about to experience the top of the Python pyramid where we look at the verbs of Python in the context of real world applications. Off to our auto garage mechanic school analogy and that puts us in a place where we are now learning the actions that we can take with these tools, like how a wrench can turn a bolt, how drills can release tires, and how screws can tighten up loose parts. And of course, most of us probably forgot the names of most of the screws from chapter one, but we've vaguely seen them before, and we're gonna start making connections as we see how everything starts fitting together. And trust me, that hard work is gonna pay off as we start putting everything together. So once again, think of each project as a car, where we now pop the hood and point out where the pieces we've been learning come together in real life applications. All right, so let's talk about these projects. Now, just as a reminder, um, I had some feedback from chapter one that people expected the code for chapter five to follow this format, two, three, four, and then where's number five? We just, in all three of the review project videos, use the same project script, so it's outside of the folder structure. So all three times, it's gonna be the same code, and it's right here, projects. Welcome to the auto garage. No need to take your shoes off. It's greasy around here. We're gonna start with creative writing, and in particular, our first line of code, which looks innocent enough, it's a simple print statement. But now that we understand functions, we know that what's actually happening is we're passing in this string of bark and it's going into some kind of function that's been defined like DEF space print, and it's meant to accept some kind of parameters, which of course we can use our shift tab to see more about our value is the most important thing, but look, there's other stuff there. And what's cool is that there's a bunch of logic that's making Python do something, which is beyond my pay grade, and it makes it so that it comes out as an output right there, print. Cool to know that actually there's some logic to the way that's all structured. Then of course you remember our 99 bottles of beer on the wall song and not like you wanna hear it again, but you can see that what we have here is some of our conditionals, our if, else, and el if. We covered all of these. It was Elsa, her iffy sister, Anna, and the elf from Santa's workshop. What else do we have here that we learned about? From the recurrence section, we've got loops. For i in range. And we talked about range in chapter one, but just to remind you that this negative one is the reason why we can count backwards. This is our start and stop. As you can see, start, stop, and step. With a negative one, that's what allows us to start at 99 and go down as we execute that line. See, if we just did zero to 99, then it could print up. So it would be like, take one bottle and put it back on the wall and pass it around and then fill it up and put it on the wall. You know, it's another way to, uh, to go about automating a boring song. Did hear a joke you've already heard before? Good. We have our print statement, which we learned about was a function. And interestingly enough, the input that we learned also in chapter one, not knowing that it was also a function is a function. So let's run this. And remember the input actually gives us a place to put in a answer. So let's look inside of this function now and see just input is the prompt. Okay, I thought I might have some more parameters there, but that's how you learn. You check how the documentation was written. All right, moving along here. Let's randomly pick some characters. We import the random module. Now chapter three is really gonna give us a chance to see what import is doing, but we have some knowledge now with our understanding of how functions work of what import is doing. We can think of import more as like an entire script, an entire package, an entire folder full of scripts. We are basically doing what we've already learned inside of a function just kind of in a more broad way. And when we have brought in something like this, we can attach it through a method, but a method is just another function that's inside of some place. So really just try to get rid of this part and you're there. This is a function that accepts this string text. But this part, which we haven't really talked about yet, is just a way to sort of build on that same concept. So that's kind of cool. So you're starting to notice a little bit of a pattern right there where we can now make this random choice generator and you can see some of the function properties that we learned in this chapter. All right now let's look at identifying positions. This is a real world script that you might wanna use to specify some kind of a string of text and some words that you want found inside of it. You can see a lot of use cases for this. Imagine this wasn't just some string that you could read, but it was, you know, a huge book. Uh, and Emily Dickens' best works, for example, and you're looking for the word Dickens. 
probably in there. Well, it's probably just at the front and the back. But like, let's say you're looking for the word aristocratic. Aristocratic is your word. Then you could put that in there, which I'm not going to pretend to spell. But you know, if I could spell it, I would have done that just to show you it could be done. Oh, wait, we didn't really like talk about anything that we learned. Yeah, so we got functions. We defined it. We learned how to define a function. This is the first time we've seen that. Once again, you're going to learn more about that search.find because we're bringing in search and it's a method. And the method looks a whole lot like a function, doesn't it? Because they're actually really close to each other. And then our return, our special keyword that fits inside of functions to return some variable like second is here. We have our two arguments that fit into parameter number one and parameter number two. Parameters are the names of the spaces and arguments are the things that go inside. Let's talk about removing some vowels. Oh yeah, we got lots of stuff here. We got stuff from our recurrent section, like a for loop, inside of something from our function section with passing in parameters. Gosh, throw some quarg args in there. Gosh, just throw in a star args and a star star quargs, and this thing would be like our whole section. Got if statements in there from our conditionals and membership operators, and then our negator, our not symbol. Did we talk about not? Yeah, we talked about that, yeah. So basically with our membership operators, we're asking is something in a group, and this is saying like is something not in a group. That's right, we did cover that keyword. You can just modify in to say not in, which is super useful. Then of course return and the way we call our function. This is our phone booth mnemonic from Doctor Who, that magical phone booth. All right, now let's talk about reversing a string. Sometimes strings just are backwards. So of course we have our function defined here. We have the place where we can put our argument in, our parameter, which is the waiting variable, and then the argument, which is the actual data, comes in through here. And then we can run one of the length functions that we played around with in chapter one and learned how they were built in chapter two thrown into a variable. We make a new list here. You've seen the while, which came up in chapter two. This is another loop just by the fact that we can see that it's got the while keyword and then it's got some logic here with our comparison operator, also chapter two, and then our syntax for how to create a loop the right way. We have our append method and then we're returning out our new joined combination. So we have booby trap turned into p p a R, R T party party boop boo to boop to party boop, party boop. Let's check for palindromes because if you're not checking for those, then you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. You got a palindrome on your hand. That's right, because taco cat is not also equal to a cat taco, but is equal to a tick ack o cat. But how do we figure that out? Good question. Good question, you guys in my head asking me questions. Once our argument comes in, and then we take that, and case fold is sort of negligible, but it just makes it so that it squishes it down because we have capitals there, kind of makes it lowercase and also removes spaces. Just kind of cleans it up a little bit and then calls it my string, puts it in this new variable. And then we actually reverse it. Anyway, so we'll reverse that string, and then we have our conditionals, if and else. And we're saying if the list that's my string, which is not the reversed one, is equal to the list of once it is reversed, then we print out that we have a palindrome. Just simple if else logic here that we learned in our conditional statement. We're building a very tiny conditional tree. We can talk about flow control, meaning how does this go in and how does it change and get processed and then eventually either come out with a return keyword, which we're not doing, or print some kind of indicator of what has happened. See you later, taco cat. All right, finally, let's pluralize words because sometimes one just isn't enough. What do we have here? A function which we're so comfortable with now and they're so fun and powerful that we'll use them all the time. A bunch of other conditions. You can see how useful that these conditionals really are when we're trying to make things really work. We have some methods which we will cover in much more detail in chapter three, but you can think of them as little attached functions because they look the same and they have the parameters come in the same and they even end with their little colon. Well, that's because it's on the if line here. Uh, we have some slicing going on, which we learned in chapter one. We have some concatenation. We're adding more characters to it. We have a membership operator. We're saying in. We're saying or. Remember, we could do not in. And we can't do not or, but we could do not in again over here. 
couple of strings. You've seen a list that we learned in chapter one. Each item and element is separated by the comma. More concatenation. Nothing new there. Nothing new there. So now we can finally call on all of this logic and we can pluralize Bob into the Bobs. I can tell that like the way we're talking about code at this point is talking to somebody who can write a program. And that's why the next chapter is really just all about constructing like good sentences and then good paragraphs and writing good stories. And you know, I mean, you're kind of there. Like it's not hard to think at this point that you couldn't actually go solve a little problem, you know? Maybe not build a real smooth bug-free app, but you could build stuff because you have the nouns and the verbs. We can start putting them together. All right, now let's talk about numbers. Now, you're probably wondering why all of a sudden all of the titles change to like Riding Roadster and Number Minivan and Automation Automobile. And that's just because I thought that was more in theme with like our being inside of an auto garage deal. And I'm not going to re-record like all of the chapter one stuff and whatever we did before this. So just know it just switched up on you because I thought it would be fun. Yeah, I can do that. All right, let's open this sliding door and hop on into the numbers minivan. So first thing we're going to look at is operators at the, at the beginning of this section. And then, of course, we have our double asterisk, which is going to be our to the powers. Uh, here we have our import and our function again. I think we saw some demonstrations of that in the last section. We have some variables and assignment operators, some floats and integers. This is all chapter one stuff. We have, have a little mix of those that we've seen a few times. Nothing really super new there. So we have another import statement here. I guess it's starting to kind of make sense to you that like that's where the real power in Python is. It's not really about being done with this class and then knowing what you need, but it's about now having the ability to go find the packages, APIs, um, kind of read through other people's pre-built code to see what they've accomplished and just being able to, to read it. So like reading English doesn't mean you should be a doctor, not until you actually like learn how to use medicine. And we're kind of just learning English. So let's look at our odd or even test. What do we have here? We have a function that has a nice demonstration of two different inputs, two different arguments for of the way we call it, and each one of those is processed differently, even though it's the same structure for the logic, which is asking the input argument, modulo 2, is that not equal to 1? And if so, then we're going to return the results. And we're both going to print those so we can see what's going on, but really that's the way you'd probably use it with that commented out. Oh, and now that I think about it, yeah, this is the first instance we've seen the logical operator. So if you think back to Spock, who was in the restaurant, our logical operator, you can use capital T true or capital F false in code to represent a logical operator. But in this case, because of the way we wrote this variable and just said, if this is not equal to that, then blink variable, nothing's really going in. We're not specifying anything. It just says false. It just knows empty or true. As in, is this variable have a liquid in it? Does the shot glass have liquor in it? Or is the shot glass empty? So there we go. Something new. Very cool. What do we have down here? In this case, we're just expanding on what was above, but we're now using a for loop, another thing that we learned that was very powerful. And we can use that for loop to find patterns. So before we talked about like a conveyor belt where you're doing the same thing to each element here because inside of our for loop, we have this conditional. Items are coming down a conveyor belt, pick up one. And if it's a certain thing, do something with it. But if it's a different thing, then don't do anything with it and just let it continue on the conveyor belt. Kind of just another way to, to use the section five conditionals with the section six loops. Cool stuff there in our auto or even test. Now let's cheat on our trigonometry homework using Python by importing the math module. And then we're using one of the methods called degrees and we're passing in a parameter and methods and functions. You're gonna learn more about this, but are very, very similar once again. And we're really just using this dot syntax to go inside of the stuff that we imported with math. Uh, we'll do it a couple more times with radians and cosines and things like that. Let's close up this minivan by looking at randomizing a guessing game. So if you guys remember this game from the first chapter, we started with a couple variables here, which is how many guesses you get total to win the game and then a random number. While the guesses are left, which is equal to the number 10 in this case, is assigned the number 10 in this case, are greater than zero, then we're gonna do this stuff. And else we're gonna do this. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah, so here's a case where normally we see if and else on the same level of indentation. In this case, we're actually saying, wow, this is happening. And then when it's not, else do this. So we, we didn't show this use case before. So we know normally we would say like, uh, if this, then else. And it would all be contained inside of here. So just there's a good way to see a different use case that you might want to use, like while this stuff is happening. And then when it's done happening, you're not just done. You can do else do this. And this was our shortcut for the assignment variable and a decrement, a, a minus of one for each number, each integer that was in there. Oh, and our breakpoint. Yeah, first time we've seen our breakpoint too. Gosh, this was a great one. Yeah, the breakpoint, remember, came when we were talking about our loops and we were able to break out of them at a certain point. Not just saying if this is equal to that and then print you win. We also have to end the game. You win and game needs to stop continuing and asking you for more guesses. What is your guess? Three. I know, because I can cheat. I see it right there. But I could be wrong if I didn't have inside information like Martha Stewart. Then I might try mm, two, one, oh, 87. Who knows? Maybe three. Bingo. So the main takeaway from this section is if you can get inside information and don't think the cops are going to catch you, you can get rich. But if you think they're going to catch you, you're going to be in jail. So, you know, weigh your options. Maybe write a Python program for that. You can use a comparison operator. Is risk of reward 1,000 times bigger than risk of going to jail? Maybe worth it, you know? you got to think about it in that kind of a context if you're going to be a programmer. Programming. It's a way of thinking. All right, next car is an old school automation automobile. A horseless carriage, as I like to say. So let's start with the Fibonacci sequence. Now, this in particular program is written in a way that is worth looking at. Although we barely touched on it, there is different ways to use the assignment variable in shorthand notation, and this is one of those examples. We take a comma b and we assign it using one assignment variable instead of two to zero comma one. We covered this before, but just a reminder, this could have also been written a space equals zero, and then a new line, b space equals space one. Just a shorthand notation. And once we understand that, it gives us this kind of kind of clever way, not the easiest way to explain the Fibonacci sequence to someone who's new, but kind of a great shorthand when you start realizing the power of Python. So we have our for loop here, and we have our shortcut here for making a list, a, a range function. And we're saying for each element in this range of 15, first print the variable a, the one that starts here at zero. And then add a to b, which b starts at 1. So on the first iteration of this, we are going to be taking 0 and adding 1 to it. So we get a total of 1. And we're taking b, which already is 1, and assigning it to a. On the second iteration, a is not equal to 0 anymore. It's equal to 1. And b is still equal to 1 on this pocket index step inside of our loop because it was added to zero. But in the next time around, it's already going to be one, which we just changed. And then it's going to be one plus one being added to B. Gives you the Fibonacci sequence in a nutshell. Think about it. Zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight. Keeps building that out. Now, FizzBuzz. Now, this is a great one to review because Remember in chapter two, we solved the FizzBuzz problem using comprehensions, one single line. Now solving this in one line is awesome, but it's a little bit easy for us to see what's going on when we solve it with multiple lines at the beginning, especially because the conditionals are so easily indented. So our for loop is obviously gonna go over this range that's creating a list. Then we have our iffy sister of Elsa's and Elsa, and then those two elves in the middle. We have our medulo comparison operator. We have our medulo operator, which really isn't a comparison operator, but it gives us a value, and then our comparison operator. The one that's very tricky to remember is much different than the single equal sign. Assignment, single equal, double equal, comparison. This is much closer to the open or closed brackets, the alligator that eats the bigger number, than it is the assignment, which is the single equal. Also a lot different than you would think about it in normally a math problem that you would put on an old chalkboard or something. And we're adding another modifier, the and, which allows us to see if that value is true. And this is a logical operator, I think. Yeah, because we'd be saying like or, and, true, false. Could be wrong on the grouping that belongs to. But yeah, but the way we think about this is that if that comparison turns out to be true and that comparison turns out to be true, then we're going to go inside of this block 
the if statement, and then else if, else if, else. Let's just solve it, because the fizzbuzz problem always reminds me of Buzz Cola. If you guys remember from before when I couldn't remember what the soda was that they drink inside of The Simpsons, Buzz Cola is the name. All right, let's go to the import truck, the section that makes the most sense at the very end of the whole course, but let's look at it. So the import truck checks to see if it's dark outside. These are a little bit more advanced programs. Let's see what we notice here. Uh, we have our dictionary noted by the curly brace brackets. Got another dictionary. We have a function looking thing called a method. We have some if and else statements here. It's comparison operator, which is greater than or equal to. We just squish the two next to each other. We also have our or logical operator. And under here, we've got another comparison operator. Let's run that. Is it dark outside? It's not. And I can confirm, even though you can't see, that it is not dark yet. It is 4.56 in Las Vegas p.m. Read in a spreadsheet. Uh, import pandas OS. We haven't talked about that. That's a way to import with a little shortcut. This is the equivalent of the comprehension, but for the import statements, makes it easier to work with things that we bring in. We'll talk about that later. Uh, here you can sort of see that even though it's like a giant line of thing, it really is just one argument being passed into the parameter that comes with the read CSV. And you can see down here that we define a variable and we put all of that stuff into it. And because that variable has a type, we can then call on some of its methods like head, which makes it so that we only get a few lines of a much bigger thing brought in. Okay, now let's look at making a progress bar. Another import thing. We've got a much huge, we've got a huge range there. What is that? Uh, 10 million? Wow. All right, so here's a big loop for us. You guys ready? We're going to time how long a million, wait, 10 million loops are. Let's do it. Biggest loop we've run yet. And then if you remember pass, I think we only talked about pass inside of a function. Uh, and we use that as kind of a placeholder, say no, there is no logic here, but that's okay. We want it to have no logic instead of throwing an error. Same thing can be applied for a for loop. I don't know if I talked about that before, but we can add pass to loops also. Interesting error. So since the last time I ran this cell at the end of chapter one, I re-recorded our install video. And I know you guys don't know this, but that means that I'm missing this module, which I had before. I haven't installed it. So we're missing now the code that it needs to run this. It can't do this line. Oh, and even better, this gives us a chance to talk about, remember from our debugging section? The stack trace. Duh, we didn't even talk about that yet. Perfect error. Look, the stack trace pointed to where the error was. And this one wasn't nested too deep down, but yeah, that's cool. So that's another thing that you've seen in real life now, real life problem that I need to solve. Don't worry about remembering what I have to do here. We'll talk about it in later videos. But I will bring up the terminal. And instead of editing this part out, I am actually going to get that module. So let's see what it's called again. But since we have Anaconda installed, all we have to do is write conda install and then the name of the module that we need. And we'll learn when you can do this and when you can't and things like that. Proceed, yes. Go get that, go get that thing, you download it, you install it, and we are done, okay? So now I'm gonna try to run this cell. I might need to like refresh the page, but let's see what happens. Oh, that's it, it worked. I didn't need to even refresh. So smart, so agile, so dynamic, Jupyter Notebook. Cool, so anyways, the point of this was we have this cool progress bar that we didn't have before. So you gotta get 10 million loops in there just to give it a few seconds to see. Cool, there you go, that was uh, more than I expected and I'm happy we had that progress bar break on us. Now let's talk about scraping jokes off a website. I got multiple imports, uh, that's real specific to the things that we imported, but as you can see, it's a dictionary. We've got a for loop down here. Ooh, look at this, dot body, dot find. We'll learn more about that. That's two dots. We've only kind of seen one dot. We're printing some stuff from the first chapter. We talked about our escape characters and the escape character and the N being the space and this being the string. And you can see we went out onto this website and we scraped jokes off of their homepage, but that has to do with the way Beautiful Soup works. And that's not part of the standard basic Python. That could be its own course actually, is scraping data. 
And if that was the course we were making, we would use a lot of beautiful soup. So there's another uh, package you could get familiar with when you're done with this course. You could also get familiar with collections or working with JSON, more things that are great for building APIs and working with APIs. So we're, here we have a Lambda, a Lambda function. Now, we will cover this in the next section. So we have not been working with functional programming. It's a style. This is about a conversation now for next chapter, how you write like a book. If you're writing Harry Potter, what's your style of writing? And we really haven't written too much real stuff. We've just been getting familiar with the verbs and the nouns. You should see more of this if you're functional style, and you should see this much less if you're more object-oriented. Although there probably could be some use cases for it, but yeah, but it's called a throwaway function, meaning you just kind of create this thing and do this thing really quick and then stuff it in this variable and then move on. So just a, a little preview there. Don't dwell on it too much. But what you can dwell on is something that we learned in our calling and parameters, our hungry, hungry hippos, the key and value argument. If we were passing in a random assortment of these, this would be the star star quargs, not the star args. In fact, we should probably check into this because I'm guessing this normally wouldn't break if we got rid of these, but it might because it wasn't using it there. So maybe that was a star quark situation, one positional argument. Let's look at, and it's saying that we need to pass into this JSON dump thing a object, which would be the root, which is this object here, this dictionary that we keep building. And then we've got this asterisk, kind of like star args, but they didn't write the args, meaning you can have a variable amount of things passed in here. And then they have to specify sort keys equals true down here because they're jumping to one of these other parameters. So you can see down here, sort keys. You can see sort keys has a false for a default. And then you've got separators over here. So they're out of order. Like you can see that they're calling this one before that one, which is just fine because they're specifying um, this equal sign here and they're attaching the key value pairs right there for the argument. So yeah, kind of cool, cool thing to see that you can put these in order and not have to worry about those. Or if you don't want to, you can just put them in however you want. So let's go back and make sure that's fixed for you guys when you download it. And there's a little bit of a look at a shared API. This by the way is a, a JSON output. It's a kind of specific format that you can send stuff over the web so that people can um, get structured data for whatever project they're doing, building on top of your data. All right, now let's look at a beautiful chart. My, is that a beautiful chart? By the way, if it's the first time you run this, you might get a little warning. Not to worry, just wait through it. It'll come out. It's kind of a cool little thing. We have a variable here and we create some random data, passing into it this capital N variable, which we specify up here as 50. So it's taking that, it's doing randomization, and then we can see that it's multiplying by 15 and then taking to the power of two, and then multiplying over here by pi. So. That's what kind of creates the random data, the area data that we're working with. So it gives it a title and then it's got some extra parameters like font size, which allow us to specify how big it is. So we got like X coordinates and Y coordinates and horizontal alignment. This is kind of where Python gets fun is you import modules and you play with that stuff and you're like, ooh, now I want a little small font. No, heck no, this is a big thing. I'm gonna like show my boss a big font and you know. You know, I think we're starting to see how a lot of this stuff is coming together and I appreciate you hanging on. I know it's been a, a long run, but hopefully you're really starting to have the skills you need to do some fun and exciting stuff. And then finally, our Oyster Rally car. I don't exactly know how I'm, you are imagining this inside of our garage, but I'm actually imagining like a giant o oyster you could sit in with like wheels on the bottom. So uh, that's a fun thing to imagine. Really, I put this section here just because import is something we could just riff on. This is the rabbit hole, and it can go off into many more courses, and this is where you take Python after you're done with the basics. And next up, we're going to be entering the most fun part of the course, Chapter 3, The Stories of Programming. And this is where we get to use all of those nouns and verbs that we've been tirelessly poring over to construct sentences, paragraphs, and finally, stories, aka applications. Now the equivalent of stories in the auto garage is cars. In chapter three, we're gonna be working with problems in a bigger context by fitting a lot of the little parts and actions together into something with purpose and intent. Like a muscle car, or a classic car, or maybe even a race car. So without further ado, I present to you chapter three, the stories of programming. <laughs>